with some of the other um, full-time staff with GLOM and, and being Samsung. I think that as we wrap this up, um, what we'll start up afterwards, we'll do, um, we'll do a survey to an extent through the Bible um, and just kind of looking in more detail of the big picture of, of God's plan in redeeming mankind and what it looks like for us to live a set apart life. Um, so I'll, we, I'm not sure if we have a, if I have a name yet, but, but our lives as basically exiles. And we'll do that going through the Bible in a survey because I know a lot of people in the room are new Christians, young Christians. A lot of people come from different Christian backgrounds. So as we do that, we'll be looking at um, some prophecies that were given in the Old Testament um, and how those are fulfilled in the kingdom um, because it's important for us to have a good foundation of understanding of God's word. Because I know sometimes uh, people ask, you know, what is this? I heard this, this person say this, heard this preacher say that, this pastor say that. Um, so we'll look at some of those things. You know, we'll talk about the end times and how a lot of people say a lot of false things that are just made up about the end times. <laughs> we'll talk about how there's no antichrist um, because a lot of people think, you know, there's an antichrist, it's Obama. You know, he's trying to make us all Muslim. And, you know, it's just not true, a lot of these things. So um, we'll look at the scripture and, uh, and we'll look at what God's word really says. We'll look at some prophecy, because I know some of you have been reading, you know, some of the prophets in the Old Testament, and you're in Revelation, the New Testament. And without having this foundation, um, really, you can just get very confused, and you can get um, kind of caught into things that really just don't matter, um, that really God's word doesn't say. So um, we'll look at those things, and we'll talk about its true emphasis, and that's on us living a set-apart life as a church. Um, and we'll look at um, Christ establishing his bride, the church. So, so that's what we'll be doing as we wrap out this series. Um, but I'm excited for today because we talked about the last couple times we've been together about um, wrapping up the end of this Replicate series. Um, and as we, one of the last things that we talked about was finding the new field and how as we go out and as we plant churches, we do so following God's calling and God's leading. Um, who's the head of the church again? Jesus is the head, right? So as we talked about before at the early times, you know, when we prepare the soil, we do so lifting up a new field to God in prayer because he is the one that gives the growth and the increase, right? So he's the one that calls us to a new field. We don't just, uh, we don't just decide on our own, oh, you know, I want to do this and that. I'm going to try and make it happen our way for God. Um, but rather, we call on God for his calling and his leading, right? We see that, for example, you know, you can think of David, um, as an example, you know, he wanted to build the temple, a uh, temple for God. Did David do it? No, it wasn't God's timing, God's leading yet, right? And we see the same in the book of Acts as they strive to follow God's will. So um, what, we've, what we've been looking at, we've looked at all of these seven stages, and now we're going to look at some at how we as individuals play a part. Um, we looked at before, as we talked about growing strong branches, how Christ has gifted all of us in different aspects of ministry. And this gets important as we look at replication, as we look at number seven where we are now, because some of you are going to be more effective um, in ministry inside of the body, and some of you are going to be more effective in ministry outside of the body. And that's what we're going to look at today. But as we do so, I want us to review a little bit this idea from Ephesians 4, because we touched on it. Um, it was a few months ago, and I don't know who was here, who wasn't. So I want to give just um, a little bit of review of this. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, if I can get someone. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Would you mind reading that, um, Dennis? Do you have that? So Christ himself gave the, gave the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God who, and become mature, attaining to the measure of the fullness of Christ. 14 is um, That's good right there. So as we look at, thanks, Dennis. So as we look at these, this passage here, Ephesians 4, um, and really all the way through verse, verse 16, we'll, we'll pick up there later, we have a really um, powerful text 
about church growth and church maturity, right? Um, there's been several places that we've gone to several times, and this is really a uh, this is really kind of a pillar text. In Ephesians, in many ways, um, the letter itself was a very important letter to the early churches because the church was such a strong body. Um, so we know this was a this was an important letter to many congregations that they would model themselves after. So we talked about earlier, and I want to look at it some more about these roles, um, these gifts of ministry that Paul talks about here, as he talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Um, and these are all important aspects of the church in order for the church to grow. As you talked about gr branches, strong branches of leadership and ministry, that's what these represent in the body of Christ, um, because gifts of ministry are founded on them. That's what we're going to see here in a little bit. So as we talk about an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a shepherd, a teacher, we see that these are important things at that time in the New Testament, but they still play an important role in the church in growing today. And we're going to clarify that a little bit um, here, in, here in a minute. Um, but as we talk about apostle, just to refresh your memory, those are those that go out and extend the gospel as a sent one. It comes from the Greek word apostolos, which literally means sent one. Um, Jesus sends out the 12 initial apostles, right? As we talk about, so they're ones that what we might think of today as a missionary. We send them out to a new task, a new mission, right? Um, a prophet, they're ones that are aligned with God's will. They care a lot about the covenant of God, and they lead the community to follow that command and to keep that covenant. Um, so the evangelists, they're a recruiter. They're passionate about bringing others in to the body, recruiting others to be a part of the group, and they're passionate about that gospel message. It means a lot to them. They want to give that to others. Um, so they're good communicators of the gospel. We talk about shepherds. Those are, they're the ones that nurture and protect and guard the body. They're focused on people. Um, they're focused on people more than the mission. They're caregivers. They take care of the community. Um, they want it to grow well and strong. As we talk about teachers, there are those that can understand well, um, but they also, more importantly, they can explain information well. Um, they can explain and communicate the truth and wisdom of God. Um, and we see that in the church, these are all pillars in the church in many ways. The body needs all of them in order to grow into maturity, as we just saw Dennis read. Um, it says that we need all these to grow into maturity, um, into the mature man and stature measured by Christ's fullness. So what we see is, is that Jesus himself, he embodies all five of these qualities. And as we as the church, um, we as a church have been gifted with all five of them. They help us to express Christ's fullness into the world as well. Um, some of you, some of you got a handout before um, a profile test um that we did like a few weeks ago um, but i have some of those we're not going to do it in class this morning just because of time but um but i want you to grab one of these um so that you can take it's a test basically and it'll go through and it will show you what is your what is your profile what is your apes your apes profile and what you'll find is is that you'll be more lean you'll have a primary profile um, so for me, as an example, my highest level is apostle, um, which is like, you know, it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise, which is like the missionary, right? And then for me, um, so that's my primary, you'll write that in your big circle there. And then my secondary is evangelistic, is the evangelist. Um, those are big for me. And uh, some of you, you know, some of you in the room might be similar. I think that Dennis is very high apostle. The apostles like to start new projects. Um, they see things in big picture kind of ways. Um, so some of you will be similar in that way. Um, but what we do from this, you can see more the gifts that we have in the, as people within the church. We see sometimes how the church might be lean in one way more than the other. So I'll explain some more of that in a little bit. But um, for those of you that haven't taken this yet, you can grab that after class, okay? Um, so what I wanted to look at a little bit um, just as we refresh these things, um, I, I want to re-look at just some of the verbiage on, on especially two of these words, because as you look at these things, we're reclaiming biblical language. 
But in reality, as we hear the words apostle and we hear the word apo- or we hear the words apostle and we hear the word prophet, we get a little eh, um, a lot today. Because really, over the last a hundred, um, especially last fifty years, um, these words have gained new baggage, right? Um, so as we talk about these words, I think it's important that we use the biblical language that we have because it's biblical. Um, rather than shining away from the verbiage that the Bible gives us, we reclaim it back in its true meaning. So as we talk about the word apostle, and as we talk about the word prophet, we do so with little lowercase letters um, in English. Where's my pen here? What's the difference between a capital, when we have like a capital and a lowercase, how is it different in English? Does it make a difference? If I write the word God, and if I write God like this, is it different in English? How is it different? You're showing uh, more reverence in the word God. Okay, it shows more reverence, yeah. How else is it different? Common noun and proper noun. Yeah, common noun and proper noun. There's the, thank you. See, you're a real English teacher, not like, not like me. Um, so common noun and proper noun, right, or pronoun. Well, when things are capital, they're a pronoun, right? And when we say capital something, like capital God, how many gods are there? It's one, right? Because proper nouns are a name of something, right? So there's one God. When we say God with a capital G, we know, oh, okay, I know, I know who you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. Just like, you know... Um, God, he is specific. And you know, when we have Bangkok, it's a capital, capital B, right? Because it's the name of a city, right? So lowercase, lowercase, how is it different? It's not proper, it's common noun, right? So it's, it's just a God, it's just a noun, right? It's a common noun. I'm just gonna do common dash noun. Common noun, there's many, there's many gods like this, right? In Hinduism, anyone know how many gods they believe in in Hinduism? 33 plus million gods. So do people believe in a lot of gods? Yeah, you know? So, so for us, when we talk about God, um, you know, Jehovah Yahweh, we took capital. So people know that it's this God, <laughs> the God of the Bible, right? Um, Judeo-Christian God, not one of the millions of millions of gods that people believe in out there, right? So having capital lowercase, it makes a difference in English um, as we talk about things. It shows the difference between a specific name um, or one of many. So, and this is important for us as we talk about this idea of apostles and of prophets, because we see, we see in English that we really should apply capital A apostles at times and lowercase apostles. Because we know that the 12 apostles, as we talked about before, they received special empowerment from God. Um, they're special chosen 12. And they were, they were gifted with special divine revelation, right? To bring forth um, and unleash the full plan of God. Um, so we're not talking about things in that way. And similarly, we see the New Testament and Old Testament prophets um, that are kind of like uppercase P prophets. Sometimes you'll see in scripture, it'll talk about Moses, it'll say Moses, Moses and the prophets. And as it talks about these prophets, it's talking about a specific group of people. Um, The people like um, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, these were those specially chosen to bring forth the plan of scripture, basically, right? Those that we kept here. So that's capital P, capital A, apostle, prophets. But we see that the New Testament, it talks about groups outside of those. Um, So in the New Testament, for example, we see multiple times where there's apostles mentioned um, in the New Testament that are not a part of the 12. Um, Probably one of the most famous that we all know of is Paul, right? Um, Paul wasn't specifically one of the 12, um, but yet he was an apostle. Another one that we know of is Barnabas, who was often with Paul, right? Um, and there are several that are mentioned in the book of Romans at the end, as it says, um, this group, these two that were outstanding as apostles. Not only were they apostles, but they were amazing. They're outstanding apostles 
Um, in 2 Corinthians, there's just a group of apostles mentioned. Um, and then we have Ap Aphroditus mentioned in the book of Philippians. And then also Paul points out how Silas and Timothy were both also apostles. Um, so this is the Greek word, as I mentioned. It comes from the Greek word apostolos. Let me kind of transliter transliterate it for you. Apostolos, which literally means to kind of send out, to send forth. You think of in, um, in America, we have our own American football. And when I throw the ball, when I throw the ball, what I'm doing is I'm also sending forth, sending forth someone to receive it, right? Um, they're going to carry on that ball to the goal. And in many ways, an apostle is like that. The apostle is the one you're sending out there to take that gospel, to carry on for the win, for the touchdown. Um, so this Greek word is used in all these ways. Um, and we looked at a little bit before how these, these people are specifically mentioned as apostles, but we really know from, from the idea of, a, of an apostle and a church planner that there are more taking hold of apostolic ministry than just this in the New Testament, right? Who are some others in scripture that you can think of that lived out their lives as apostles as well? These are all specifically mentioned as apostles, but really there's... There's a, there's a handful of, of others that you, can, that you can probably easily think of that were also very apostolic. Anyone think of a few names? Uh, the Samaritan woman? Huh? Jonah? Yeah, God did send Jonah. Jonah was like a, um, he was a prophet we know, but yeah, he was sent for a specific reason and mission. Yeah, that's very apostolic. She'll mention the Samaritan woman who goes out, she reaches the whole town. So we looked at her as a uh, person of peace. But yeah, that's very apostolic, evangelistic. Um, in the book of Acts, there's, there's several that we know that they're a part of Paul's really kind of apostolic circle. Um, those not mentioned here include Apollos. You know, we looked at in Corinthians how he talks about, um, I planted Apollos waters. Um, we know that Apollos was a part of these churches growth and development. You know, Priscilla and Aquila in the New Testament, those also um, we know were big apostolic leaders and helping um, establish churches. And Romans, uh, we see them mentioned at the end that we know that they're with Paul in Corinth. They're a big part of this kind of groundbreaking ministries going on in areas. So there's a few examples of just um, of this role of apostle that many times um, today we've overlooked uh, because really it carried before um, some baggage with that language that we need to look at and reclaim so that we're able to empower these people to their full ability. I um, mean, prophets are a similar way because really I think a lot of times um, in the Christian world, when we hear prophet, we normally think of they know magic things from God. <laughs> uh, magic things from God is what first comes to mind. And that's not just the case. As we talked about a prophet, there's someone who's especially passionate um, about keeping the covenant of God. Um, and holding the community of faith to the covenant and will of God. Um, so we see that in the book of Acts um, alone, there are several prophets mentioned, um, just kind of at passing by people, um, people that God had empowered in a special way. Um, they were there, they were there oftentimes too, um, prophets we see at the beginning of new works and ministries um, that we'll take a look at later here in the book of Acts. Um, Acts chapter 13 specifically. So there's all five. I mean, as I mentioned, all five of them are represented in Jesus Christ. They help us uphold our role in proclaiming Christ to the world. But also we see, as we look at each five, that Jesus himself, he's the perfect embodiment of all five um, gifts, of all five roles of ministry. So apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. As you think about who's the best example in scripture, who's the best example that we've seen, you know, different people might come to mind here and there, but in reality, Jesus is the ultimate of all of them. So you can grab your Bibles, you can turn to these places as you look at them, but I just wanna give um, a few examples of Jesus in each five of these capacities. So as we think about Jesus as an apostle, um, our brother Panchai, as he, as he gave the encouragement for the Lord's Supper, he talked about this, right? How we looked at earlier how we know that our God is, our God is concerned about missions because he was the very first 
missionary, right? And that he sent who? He sent his son, Jesus, right? Um, Jesus says it this way in John 20, verse 21. He says, peace to you. He says, as the Father has sent me, he says, I also now send you. Um, so we know that God sent his son to this world because he loves us, right? So in many ways, Jesus was the first one to leave his original home, his original context of heaven, right? He left his home place to go into a new um, place, earth, for us, right? To reach us and engage us. And that's what apostles do. They go from one context, we say, um, one culture, um, into a new one um, to bring them the gospel. Um, and we know that Jesus himself, he's the ultimate prophet. Um, in Acts chapter 3, in Acts chapter 3, um, it's quoted, it says, Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up from you, for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him in every way um, and everything that he will say to you. This prophet that he's talking about, that we raise up in the likeness of Moses to lead the people of Israel back to God is who? It's Jesus, right? Um, so prophets help draw the people, uh, the people of God nearer to God. And who does that better than Jesus? Jesus, as he went back to his hometown, um, we see this in the three, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, basically, he gets thrown out, right? They run him off. They try and kill him, right? And what does Jesus respond? He says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household, right? So we see not only is he called a prophet, but Jesus, he felt like a prophet. Um, something about prophets, um, as they draw people back to God, they care a lot about sin. Sin is a big thing with prophets. If people are sinning, um, they're exposing sins of individuals, of communities. So normally prophets are not so popular in reality, right? Because who likes being confronted when we're wrong? Does anyone ever come up to you and say, oh, you know, I realized that you did this, you know, really, it's sinful, or, or you wronged me or this person in that way? Does that ever feel good? <laughs> no, we don't like it. You know, in the long run, you know, initially, when we're rebuked, it just doesn't feel good. I think it's a human thing. We don't respond going, oh, thank you, you know, I'm a bad person. Uh, thanks for letting me know. Normally, we feel defensive, we get upset, uh, we don't like it, right? <laughs> if we're a non-Christian, if we have sin in our hearts, we're going to be really angry, right? Because we're going to be stubborn. We're not going to repent. But if we repent, we could turn around. We're thankful in the end, right? But initially, people don't like the prophets <laughs> because of that. They're always bringing this, quote, unquote, bad news of, oh, no, I've got to turn around. I've got to change these things. And that's why we see them leading Jesus off, right? That's why we see in the Old Testament, you know, they're killed sometimes, right? Uh, because the role of prophet is somewhat of an unpopular role. Um, so we also know that Jesus, not only was he the ultimate apostle or prophet, but he's also the ultimate evangelist, right? Jesus himself, as he first began his ministry, it was an evangelistic ministry. Um, as he says in Matthew chapter 9 and 35, it says, Jesus, he went out into the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. Um, the word actually, the word actually evangelist, it comes from the Greek word gospel, um, which is euangelion. Um, euangelion um, is where we get our word euangelius, um, someone that takes good news, um, or evangelist is how it's been transliterated. Um, someone that carries off the good news for Jesus and his ministry. It was now is the time. The kingdom's coming. He began rallying people um, to the cause, um, the role of an evangelist. Uh, we also know that Jesus, he's the ultimate shepherd. Glum read from this passage earlier, right? He says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The ultimate sign of a shepherd is self-sacrifice. So you think about a good shepherd, they're willing to do whatever it takes to protect those that they love, they care about, right? And we know some that have just um, really protective natures um, uh, and taking care of their family, looking after those that they love. They say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to provide and protect those that I love, those that I care about. Um, they're a shepherd, um, like Jesus. If you think about a teacher as well, Jesus, he was the best 
teacher also. We see that early on in his ministry, he begins gathering around the crowds, right? He says, I want to explain and clarify to you the message of God. And he starts that in Matthew chapter 5, right? With the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you may have heard that it was said in this way. He says, but I tell you this, right? They had heard a lot. They've heard, they've heard the commands of God. But he says, I want to clarify. I want to teach you these things. So in Matthew 1, or chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, When he saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, and his disciples came to them, and then he began to teach them. And we see this is taking on the position of a teacher in Jewish society. They would, they would do this often. They would sit down to teach, to explain things. Um, so not only do they care about the knowledge, um, but they communicate it in a good way. They give it illustrations, metaphors, when needed, so that you're getting the information um, in a way that you understand, right? That's when a, that's when a teacher is good. <laughs> it's not just that they can say it, they can just say it, they can talk about it, um, but that you're understanding the, the information they're trying to get across, right? I think some of us have had, we've had good teachers, we've had bad teachers, right? Maybe you had the professor, he's up there on the board, he's doing crazy things, and you're like, I see you saying things, but I just don't understand it, right? I'm a good teacher is helping you to understand the information that they're, um, that they're giving you. Um, we see also the woman at the well in John chapter four, as she realizes, as she realizes that this man Jesus is special, she begins to think of the Messiah that she's heard of because the Samaritans, they especially believed in the Messiah as a great teacher. So she said, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. And when he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. She was confused about worship, right? She says, what is it about? It's about this place, that place, this time, that time. She says, I know that Messiah, when he comes, he's going to clarify all of these things. Um, and Jesus says, I am he, right? And that's what he did. He's shown us and taught us how to live rightly in God. Um, so we see Jesus, he embodies all five of them well. In reality, all of us Christians, we touch on them in some way, right? Because in reality, they're Christian, they're Christian qualities um, that we can all strive for. Should we be teaching God's word? Yes, right? Should we be drawing people to God? Should we care about following God in his will? Um, should we be taking that gospel message out to others? Yes, you know, these are all, we know, good things. But in reality, um, we've all been given a different grace of them, right? Um, and some people um, are effective as leaders um, in these areas. So um, people now, um, as we look at church growth and missions, we realize that in reality, these five roles of APES, um, that they're present in all, in all proper functioning organizations. What I mean by that is, is that if you look at a good business, as you look at a good organization, like um, a football team or something um, that's working well, um, in reality, they're gonna have some version of these five roles also functioning well. Um, that they have these kind of, these kind of roles um, all helping contribute to the group. Um, and that's important because they're all very different. <laughs> um, and that means that you have a lot of potential for argument, for disagreement, for clashing, but if you work together, you can accomplish a lot. Um, so I have one little illustration that I touched on before that I just want to that I want to re reshare to help us understand a little more and using the Avengers to help us understand kind of these profiles um, because I think that a lot of people understand and know what the Avengers are. Anyone not know who the Avengers are? They're like superheroes, okay? Um, it's a team of superheroes. Um, so someone got together and was like, "What if we didn't just work as superheroes separate, but we came together?" together, right? The best of the best, Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers, right? Um, and in the Avengers, there's all different kinds of people, all these different kinds of abilities. And we see that really um, that some of them, they represent kind of these apex giftings, okay? So, um, so for example, um, in the newer movies and stuff, there's this guy, Nick Fury. He's, he would be the apostle among the group because he's the one that comes up with the idea. Because apostles, apostles are innovative. They like new ideas, new projects. They take hold of challenges. So he's the organizer. He's the groundbreaker. He's the one that said, hey, I've got this crazy idea. Let's try and get these superheroes to come together and to work together. So they like taking risks. They're creative. Um, and also, apostles can often see the potential for the potential in others. They can see the giftings in others. 
So for example, Nick Fury, he was able to see, hey, I want this guy, I want Iron Man, I want the Hulk, I want that person. Um, the apostle works in this way. We see Paul, you know, he says, bring to me John Mark. He's useful to me in my ministry. He can see where people fit, where to send them um, to help the church grow. So Nick Fury, he's kind of the apostolic one in the group. Um, so you think about the prophet, um, Tony Stark, I would say, um, is probably a good representation of a prophet uh, because they like to ask questions. Um, they're always thinking forward and they care a lot about their code, right? Um, what they have their mind set on. They often are more concerned about how he believes things should be. The prophet, they say, I know what it should look like. <laughs> I know what it should look like. They care more about what they believe, their foundation, than, than the opinions of others. Um, they're willing to go against the crowd, against the flow. Um, and they're strong believers in change and progress. They want, they want to revamp things to back how it should be, right? If someone's drifted away, if a person's uh, drifting off of the path of God, they say, hey, you need to come back. <laughs> you know, you're losing, you're losing track there, come back. So like I said before, they often do not work well or play well with others at times, right? Sometimes they themselves, they say, you know, you're ungodly, you're sinful. <laughs> what you're doing is not the gospel. And they say, you need to come back. Um, you need to come back into the fold. Um, so sometimes though, they can, they can feel like an outcast, but sometimes others outcast them. Uh, similar to Tony Stark, right? He's kind of like, oh, I'll do my own thing. And he's willing to fly around, zap people, zap people on his own. But really, he works best within the group. Um, so there's the prophet, Tony Stark, Iron Man. As we think about an evangelist, um, there's someone, everyone loves meeting an evangelist, um, I believe. Um, you know, they're the first contact. They're passionate about the gospel. Something about being with them helps you understand the gospel yourself, right? And when I think about evangelistic people in my mind, they're people that just for some reason, they're always a joy and blessing to be around, right? Um, and they can recruit others. They're the ones that are the friendly smile. It's easy for them to get others to see the love of Christ in the church, right? Um, I think that this group, there's a lot of effective evangelists. You know, Mick, um, Glenn talks about Mick a lot during the week. He's ready. He's off his smile, um, you know, as he's passing out um, the tracks, the flyers. Um, and people, they see him, you know, they, he looks welcoming. He's a nice, friendly white guy, right? <laughs> this morning they say, hey, yeah, I'm really going to talk to him. He looks really nice. You know, if it were me, um, I let my beard grow out a little bit. If I'm in my skate hoodie, not so friendly looking at them, right? They're going to be afraid. <laughs> um, but the evangelists, they're welcoming. They're fun. They're friendly. I think of also of Jane. Um, Jane's not here today, but Jane's very evangelistic, right? She's just warm. She's fun. She's friendly. It's easy to talk to her, right? Um, evangelists, oftentimes, not only do they enjoy time with the body, um, but also they like being with not yet Christians. They're out with them. It's easy for them to talk about um, things that are sometimes a sensitive subject um, with a person, even when they disagree. They're like, you know what? I really disagree with you, but I still like you. <laughs> you know, that person might be an evangelist, right? Um, so Natasha Romanoff is an example because she's often sent out. She's that first contact, right? Um, she goes in, and they're like, oh, look, she's really nice, she's friendly, but in reality, she's normally there to kill them all. But, um, but they're like, you're really nice, I like you. And in reality, most of the group gets along with Natasha, right? Um, Captain America, who's been dead for a long time, you know, he's like, I have no one to talk to. Natasha can talk to him. Um, the Hulk, he's like, I want to kill and smash all things, all people, but Natasha can talk to him, right? Um, because they're open about their own humanity. They're willing to show their own weaknesses, their own, their own faults, so that others feel comfortable doing the same. That's an evangelist. Um, so you talk about a shepherd. I mentioned they're willing to stand up for the flock, for the body, to do anything it takes to protect their group. Um, I can't think of anyone as a better example than Steve Rogers, Captain America, right? Because in, in the group, he's not necessarily the leader, as a shepherd of the group, but he cares about protecting the group, right? As he goes into battle, he wants to know that his team is doing well. Um, sometimes, not only does the shepherd care about the mission, but they care about protecting their group in the mission. They say, we went in with 10 people, we're coming out with 10 people, right? Um, it's because of this, the shepherd is willing to do whatever it takes to protect the group, even to die for, for the group, right? So when you look at um, Captain America in the movies or in, or in stories in the comic books, he's always like jumping on a bomb, the enemy throws in a grenade, you know, Captain America is flying towards a grenade. 
um, to stand in front of it, protect those he loves, he cares about. And shepherds do the same with the church. They say, you know, I want to save, protect my body. We need to be together. We need to be doing things that are encouraging and strengthening one another. I don't want to lose anyone to the world, right? They're going to be thinking in protective ways of the group. Um, as I think about a teacher, um, I think about Bruce Banner. Not Bruce Banner as the Hulk. You know, he's also the Hulk. Um, the Hulk's pretty different. He's maybe like apostolic, <laughs> smashing ground. Um, but Bruce Banner, he's a teacher of the group. You know, he's really nerdy. Um, he's really nerdy. He's always learning things. Um, he's always trying to do his little research. Um, but not only is he just learning it, because some people, they're away in a the corner. They're happy to just learn and learn and learn on their own. But Bruce Banner, he wants to teach, he wants to share. He says, here's where we made mistakes before. Look, I know how to explain it, how to make it better. Um, he feels most comfortable passing on this knowledge to the group. He says, I, he says, I feel good with being back at the base camp, back in the classroom to help teach you um, so that you can do your best job out there, right? Bruce Banner is happy being at base um, and not going out on the mission. <laughs> he knows that he's used there. He says, I don't need to be out on the field. He says, let's just, let's just look at this. Look what I've learned. He says, this will help us. Um, so we see that there are, um, they care about the information. They want to pass that on. And they feel equipped. Um, they feel encouraged doing that. It blesses them to share and to teach. Um, so as we look at all of these, as we look at all of these, we see that they all contribute to the building up and to the growth of the body. Um, Paul goes on to say in verse 14, verses 14 through 16. Can you, would you mind reading that, Dennis? Uh huh. Which verse again? 14 through 16. Then we, then we no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become the, in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. 16. Through 16. Mm -hmm. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part of it does its work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, so he talks about how um, these are important for our maturity, right? So we can grow strong as a church. We're not, we're not weak. We're not tossed down by the waves, right, of this world, the pressure of this world. He says this happens. This happens as we grow in together. Um, this, the Christian standard, it says, as you become fitted and knit together. I think that what Dennis is trying to says, as you join in together, right? It's not a solo mission. Um, it's not you all going out and doing your own thing. But we talked about before, we're working together as the body of Christ and the proper working of each individual part, um, which is important. Um, we learn to accept, embrace one another in love. Um, it's important for us to talk about the different roles of APAS so we can understand ourselves more, um, but also so we can learn to appreciate and love and respect one another. Um, I believe that um, among the church here, there's the full-time staff. You know, Michelle and I work alongside with B, Sam, and Glom, and P. Rung, and P. Rung was here before, and Nung was as well. And I believe that among our group, we had a good representation of all five of these roles. And we worked really well together, um, the group of us, because um, we learned to accept and embrace one another. But in reality, there's a lot of times where we clash. And there's a lot of things where um, maybe Rung and Nung, who have higher profit profiles, um, that naturally clashes really easily with those that have a higher shepherd, um, shepherd role, like Sam and B, um, where they, they think of you know, protecting and taking care of that flock. The things that the prophet wants to do in bringing change, you know, those are scary changes that really, that's like a bad word to a shepherd, basically. <laughs> because sh change means rocking the boat. What will people think of that? You know? um, but when you learn to embrace, accept one another, um, really it creates opportunity for the most growth. So um, next year, for example, in the Avengers, this is not a spoiler alert, but next year there's a new movie coming out. Have you guys heard of it? The new Captain America movie. It'll talk about Captain America. You know, he clashes um, 
he clashes in the end with Iron Man. They split up sides uh, because Captain America, he cares about his group. He says, they're trying to hurt, they're trying to, they're trying to harm us as superheroes. Um, and Tony Stark says, no, you know, we need to follow the law, um, a law that says, you know, we need to, we all need to commit and submit to the government, basically. And Captain America says, no, this is bad. So they end up, they end up clashing this way. There's a split that happens. If we're not careful in the church, um, instead of appreciating and accepting one another, um, we can fight like this. We can allow the giftings to pull us apart. Um, so we talked about these are all focused in on Christ. In reality, all of our ministries in the church spring forth from these roles. So we talk about you know, things like small groups. They come from the shepherding roles. We talk about teaching Bible classes, doing camps, writing material. These are things from the teacher. We talk about going out, doing street evangelism. Um, uh, projects where we can reach the lost. Those are things that the evangelist is going to be passionate about. So you talk about um, our worship, um, you know, doing all-night prayer sessions, uh, you know, maybe even our, our worship ministry. Uh, those are things the prophet is going to care about. We talk about social justice, helping the poor, helping the forgotten. The prophet is concerned. We talk about um, church planning, networking, um, things to help and build up the church the apostle is going to care about those things. So, um, so as we look at these things, it also matters as we begin thinking about this stage of replication. Because as we replicate the church, as we replicate the church, there's a go team and there's a stay team. Um, and as we look at this, um, two words that kind of help us to understand it is this idea of settlers and pioneers. And at least it helps me understand as an American. So settlers and pioneers, let's talk about this. Settlers and pioneers. Settlers and pioneers, those are people that lived in America in the past. <laughs> um, when America was first started, no one basically lived there, right? They're only the Native Americans. So first the pioneers, they went out and they built the place. Um, and the settlers, they built up that camp, right? Um, so in the church, in the church really, we have these two groups. There's this group um, that they're more focused on building up the church um, keeping that body strong, helping nurture and mature it, like we saw in phase six, right? Um, that's especially focused on that. And the pioneers, they're those that are like, let's go out, let's take the gospel to new frontiers, new places, right? Um, so we see um, the state, the settlers, they stay, they help grow. That's the teacher. The teacher, you know, they're going to be giving them the truth, helping equip them fully. You know, we can understand and know the gospel quickly, right? We're going to understand the fullness of God yet? No, it takes more time, right? You need effective teachers helping in that way. I mean, you need the shepherds guarding, protecting. You need the evangelists as well encouraging that group. Without evangelists within the church, it can feel kind of dead, right? <laughs> um, you know, they're kind of the life of the party to an extent. Um, so, they're, so the evangelists we see, they're part of the settlers, the stay and grow team, but they're also a part of the start and go team. You know, the pioneers in the old days, they're the ones in America that got on the, the wagon and the carriage, right? And so we're going off. We're going off way out west. We're gonna find new frontiers and mine gold, right? There was something in their spirits to say, we're ready to take on a challenge, ready to take on an adventure. Um, that was the apostle, right? That apostolic role. And we see that the apostle, prophet, and evangelist, they're part of this go team. They're the ones ready to start new frontier and mission with God. Um, so we see these two different groups. As you think about the church, you think about like the church as a body, two of them are especially focused on putting their energies in towards the body, and two of them are more focused on time outside of the body. So the shepherd and teacher, let me draw, this is the church. The church not as a building, but as us as a community. The shepherd and teacher, they feel most at home within the church, right? Um, they like time together in with the body, and they're good at equipping in with the body. But the apostle and prophet, in reality, um, the apostle, they're going out to start new ventures, right? So they like that. They want to be out. They feel most um, connected with God, actually taking on challenges for God. Um, so they like the time out. The prophet they feel most comfortable outside of the body, not because they don't like um, time with the church or they want to be necessarily with the lost, but because they like being just out and alone with God, right? So we see oftentimes the prophets in the Bible, they're out in the desert, right? 
they feel most connected with God when they're out, they're alone. And we see the evangelists, they're a part of both groups, right? Um, because they're a part of that go team. They're a good first contact. They help break that ground and carry the gospel, but they also help revive and draw the church to do so. So as we look at these seven stages, these are important as we think about church growth and development, but also church planning, right? Uh, because in reality, as we look at these different phases that happen, some roles, some roles play a more pivotal part um, in different stages, right? As we look at the seven, at the seven um, stages, you know, in the earlier stages, the apostle, prophet, and evangelist, they're gonna be playing a higher part, right? And it's going to shift over more towards the evangelist, shepherd, and teacher. Do you see that? So initially, as we talk about preparing the soil, what did, who do you think plays a high part in planning, preparing the soil? What kind of role will be passionate about preparing the soil? Apostles will, apostles will a lot because they want to go out and find new ventures, um, but also, also the prophets because they spiritually are going to be taking up um, new things in prayer to God, right? Um, so we see that as the ground first breaks, um, the apostle and prophets, they're the ones that are going to be present. Look here in Acts chapter 13 as an example. Acts chapter 13, it says, starting in verse 1, it says, In the local church at Antioch, it says, there were, there were prophets and teachers. It says, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, uh, Lucius, Cyrenian, Manian, and a close friend of Herod, the Tetrarch of Saul. So, as they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Paul, or Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called to them. Then, after they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them off. Um, so we see here in this group, there are these prophets. Um, there's this high concentration, uh, for the most part, of uh, body life. Um, they're connected with God, right? Um, and we see the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul and send them forth to new ventures. Um, so we see oftentimes on the ground, we have the prophet and apostle initially as groundbreakers. Um, they're the two that are there and ready. When you look at missionary couples, all oftentimes going off to new frontiers, new mission fields, a lot of times there'll be a pair of apostle and prophet, um, like Michelle and I. A lot of my friends as missionaries, as they do this little test, they realize that a lot of times the husband, he's very apostolic, the wife is very prophetic. And these two groups, they do well together. Um, they need balance. And um, this is important as you think about going off to new fields because as we go out and we think about multiplying churches, if we go out, we multiply, but we send the shepherd and teacher roles to go out to new areas <laughs> and to go into unknown challenges, you know, really they're out of their comfort zone. Um, they're, taking on, uh, they're taking on a task that, that really they haven't been equipped for, right? Um, I had friends that planted, um, and really I helped be a part of a church plant uh, a, year, a few years ago, and when it multiplied, uh, we were excited. And it was like, wow, look how big the body is. We're ready to plant the new church. We're ready to multiply. But as the church multiplied and was divided, the new group, the new group got all of the ease. <laughs> they got all the evangelists. <laughs> um, and really, um, from that, a lot of the life, the energy was gone, basically. Um, so for the old group, you know, before they were a growing community. Um, but now they didn't have any evangelists. What happens? They're just kind of stagnant, right? <laughs> They're kind of stale. And, you know, if teachers go off to the new group, you know, they say, you know, I'm excited to teach people um, complicated things in scripture. They go off to the start, start and plant group. Really, are they going to have any, teacher to, any people to teach yet? No, there's not going to be anyone, right? You know, they may be passionate about teaching people, but at first, you know, the things are going to be explaining their basic truths of God's word, right? So as we talk about APES, it's important for us in understanding our role within the church so you know how God, how you most feel used and equipped by God. Um, and also for us as a church, as we look at, how can we best empower you um, to help you um, to fully fulfill your ministry? Because sometimes 
sometimes we're put in places, not necessarily that are wrong for us, because uh, it's good for us to always stretch. We're not being used to our ultimate potential, basically. Okay? So, um, let me erase this here. So, as you leave here, um, you can grab, you can grab this, uh, the test, and then, let me see where I have it. You can grab the test, and then there's also a score sheet like this. And what you'll do is, it'll come up with some figures there, some numberings, and you'll be able to see, you know, what is your biggest one? Um, and you'll be able to think about, you know, what are the things that we talk about here? You know, do you see it, do you see it speaking, speaking to you in those ways? In reality, you know, we understand people that are most like us. Um, as you see, you'll probably realize, you know, as we, if we looked at everyone else, um, you'll click most with those that are like you. You feel most comfortable with them, basically. Um, and, uh, and you'll be able to see, you know, you'll be able to appreciate, you know, the roles that others take on. You know, Eric's not here. Eric definitely has high teacher, right? Um, Eric's always, you know, he's upstairs teaching the group. He's really good at teaching the English. Um, he's very teacher, teacher-like. Um, so you'll be able to see the ways that we all contribute to the body of Christ. Um, so I'll leave us in prayer and we'll be done for today.